over my career, I have spoken with a lot of photographers and quite often I am the only person in the room who's had any sort of formal training in photography. And I thought it might be interesting to share with you today my experiences as a photographic student and what I gained from it and how it enabled me to have this fulfilling career that I am able now to share with other people like you to help also you enjoy your photography. Shortly after my grandfather passed away, we moved to South Africa. And, and in those days, there was national service still going. And that meant that basically, once you finished high school, you had to go and serve two years in the army, sort of trooping around the bush being shot at. And I wasn't overly keen on, on any of this. So I wanted to go and do something that would enable me to defer my national service. My marks weren't particularly good, so I kind of looked around. Unfortunately, photography was an option at the Pretoria Technicon Art School. There was a, a course there that was three years, so it fulfilled the requirements for tertiary education. And they didn't need any specific marks, which was really good, just, just that you'd kind of taken science. So I put off an application and, and I whizzed it off to them. And uh, yeah, so they, they, they came back and they said, look, we'd like to have an interview with you. I remember going to that interview and, and being in this building that looked very much like my school, but not. Always though there were there were kids with long hair around, and this being South African in the early 90s, short hair, this is this is way too long for school, uh, was very much a thing. So to see see boys with, with longer hair was was wow, just like amazing. And I remember feeling quite grown up going off with my little box of prints and stuff uh, for the, for this interview. In the interview room, there were three lecturers from the photography school, and, and I'm just going to do a shout out to one of them, Harold. Hi, Harold, because uh, I know he, he watches these videos from time to time, and, and I, I very much doubt he remembers me interviewing, but, but you never know. But I, I turned up there, and they asked me you know, a load of questions. What did I do? You know, did I do any after school work? And I was working at, at a news agent's helping to sell film and stuff, so they asked me some questions about ISO and, and whatnot. And then they asked me about some of my photographs and to explain why I'd taken them and, and, and things of that nature. And I remember that my answers were mostly nonsense. <laughs> they were just things I was just winging it and, and kind of remembering half remembered things from, from the photography magazines that I read. So there was one uh, image in particular of a motocross bike, uh, which uh, was shot on a, 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 an Olympus, I think. Uh, what in South Africa is called a, a Mukundruk, which is a little point and shoot camera. And that was, it was shot in, it, it, the sunlight was going down, so it's quite dark. So the flash went off because obviously it's kind of auto exposure and, and the motorbike came up quite close to me and because it's slow shutter speed, it's got some shutter drag and stuff, which is all by accident. Um, but I made up this nonsense story about how the, 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 the photograph came together. And evidently I said enough that it sounded like kind of a new some of the terms uh, and I was quite surprised when the the, the school sent me back uh, an application and said uh, yes you're accepted so come along on the 15th of January or, or whatever it was. The whole of first year was really getting to grips with the the alchemy and, and the, the technicalities of, of film so it was all about learning how light works how film works how the two react together how to develop film all those, the, the nuts and the bolts of, of the technical side of things. And then there was the aesthetic and, and the practicalities of shooting. So it's things like, you know, learning about uh, uh, f-stops and shutter speeds and and how to, to speak visually by, by looking at the work of, of, of great photographers. So there's this, this blend of what I've gathered are two disparate systems within most photography schools, uh, certainly in the UK and, and possibly the US, that you either learn the theory and the art of photography or you learn the technical aspects and ne never really sort of the two together. So I think I was exceptionally fortunate in that regard. I remember going to photo school and the first couple of weeks there especially was, was a real life eye opener for me because all of a sudden, rather than being the only person who was interested in photography, as, as I was at school, all of a sudden I'm, I'm surrounded by everybody who shares a common interest, you know, so, and of course this is pre-internet days, so there weren't groups online you could go and hang out with and stuff like that. This was, this was, this was a, a revelation that there were so many people who were, like me, interested in photography. And it was, it was great to, to hear people talk about photography, especially the second and the third years and the lecturers who knew a bit more, and also to be around it, to, to be immersed in this world of 
the latent image, the, the, this intangible thing that what we create is from all around us. And that, for me, is the foundation of everything that was important with, with learning photography at photo school, was to be in an environment where you just eat, drink, sleep and breathe photography and image making day in, day out. In retrospect, I, I was extremely lucky. I didn't really know how lucky I was at the time to have a this environment that was extremely stimulating and I had access to so much gear. I, like you wouldn't believe the amount of gear. We had a, and a, a studio fully equipped with like good lighting, like bronze color stuff and, a, and, a, and a, an equipment store that you could take out all the kit that you wanted. And, and I'm talking not just like one or two, there's a lens or something like that. This was a store like the size of this room, and this room's fairly large, that had Hasselblads, Vermeers, Bronikers, had, had large format stuff. It had quirky lenses, you know, like, like, like a 40 mil for a Hasselblad, I think it was recorded. It was wide, it was a chunk of glass like this. And whatever you wanted was there for the taking. So from a technical, for, you know, from an equipment standpoint, you could do pretty much whatever you wanted. And this is, again, where I sort of, I got the idea that, that, that kit isn't really what makes your photography better. It enables you to, to make your vision come right. But I think the majority of the, the images that I took at photo school were on my A1, my Canon A1, with a 50 mil lens or a 28 mil lens. Occasionally I used my 7210. When I got into second year, I, I, I ended up having my own Hasselblad 500C. So I did some work on that. Um, but the majority of the stuff was just using very basic lenses, nothing wildly exciting. We used them and they were there as something to experiment with, but they never became the, the staples. And I think that was the thing, that because we had access to all this gear, it didn't plant in us in our minds this idea that an elusive piece of kit we don't have is somehow going to fix the problem we have now. At the photo school, there was also a little library outside the color developing uh, room where the, the machine for the, for the color prints was, because that was the only automated thing we had in the whole uh, photo school was this automated uh, machine for prints. So you'd put your print in there and you go and sit down and go and have a smoke or, or what have you. And in this library, there were books, like re like good books about photography, you know, the, the old time life um, uh, sets about exposure and, and, and things. And books that introduced me to photographers that I'd never heard of. So, and, and I'm not talking like kind of mysterious names, you know, these are names that very rarely got mentioned in the likes of practical photography, which were, they were, they were great and they, they served their purpose, but they were very much mainstream photography. So occasionally they would talk about some famous people, you know, like, like David Bailey or what have you. But for the most part, they just talked about photography that was firmly aimed at the amateur. And I don't say that in a disparaging way. I mean, things that amateurs were interested in, you know, so how to take a nice landscape, how to take pictures of your grandchildren. Things, these sort of things that appeal to, to the, the camera clubs and what have you. So they weren't like about, you know, the work of William Eggleston and the use of colour in Ernst Haas's sort of things. They weren't that kind of like highbrow. I don't really want to say highbrow, but, but I think you, you get the point. But they were there and you could read them, flick through them and all of And so they were introducing me to photographers who, whom I'd never heard of. And of course, you could then ask the lecturers who do know who these people are, you know, who's this? Because in those days, again, no internet, so you couldn't just go and look it up. I mean, we had to ask Harold or Flip or, or Bertie or what have you, who these photographers were. And they would say, well, in the library, there's this, mag this, this book and that book. And there was a, a, a collection of films that we were able to, to watch occasionally, which I dearly wish <laughs> that were still available because I love these kind of things. So all of that was great in, in feeding this, 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 this mind of mine that was just absorbing all this, this photography. And that's, that is why I got to a point where the biggest benefit to my photography was be able to, to put all these images into this memory bank inside my mind and have them meld together and blend and, and what have you, like, like a chef would use different ingredients to produce a recipe in my photography that is uniquely mine that I feel that it has a voice and that voice has changed over the years and it, and it, and it evolves and it shifts and it, and it moves around. And that's natural and all of our photography does that. 
but it's having this 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 environment to breed that initial <laughs> I keep thinking about spores <laughs> so so the initial fungus of my photography got a breeding ground a photo school which is possibly not the, the world's best analogy but there we go that it, it is it has evolved and it has grown and I, I would like of course these days that we have so many places to do it. and I hope this this channel is is a part of that for you <laughs> a breeding ground of spores <laughs> for things but a just kind of a place that can help you draw more inspiration to feed your own memory banks. Photography school was, was great and, and obviously in, it is a means to an end. It is not just a three-year jolly, it, you, it is training you to be a photographer, to give you the tools that you need to be a professional. Now you don't need to go to photo school, you absolutely don't need to. Had I not gone to photography school, I could have gone and worked for general practice photographer like I did when I left photography school and learned, learned my trade on, on the job. I loved being at photo school. I, it, it, there are a couple of periods of my life that have stood out for me over my 45 years or so of being alive. And, and photo school is, is one of them. It was great to be around photographers. It was great to be in that environment. and and. But I have a regret, and my regret is that I didn't make as good a use of that time as, as possible. I was not the best student when it came to the, the technical aspects of things, you know, so like, like missing exams and not doing essays and not handing in, in coursework. And, and I, my work slipped behind. My, my, my photography and actually taking photographs never really was, was a problem, but the academic side of things, I didn't do as well as I should have done. And, and I didn't make as much use of the time and I certainly didn't appreciate the lecturers for what they were sharing with us through that, that, those three years that we were there. And this is something I want to impress on you about why it is useful to go and study photography if you're able to, is that you will be in an environment where people are nurturing you and, and want you to succeed and grow and they will give you the tools and the nudges and the directions to do so. The internet is great and things like this to be able to talk and, and give you suggestions and help is, is, is wonderful. But it's no substitute for being with somebody, with, in, a, in a group of people who are all like-minded and they want to help. Learning to be a photographer is a lifelong thing and it's never too late to start. You're never going to be the complete photographer. All the photographers who I feature on this channel in my so Greats of Photography playlist never stopped trying to improve themselves, never stopped trying to push their photography further. I don't know of a single photographer who's ever gone, do you know what, I have now reached peak photography. I cannot get any better than this. You will never be a complete photographer. Being inspired by photographers is, I find, the greatest way of developing my own vocal stylings, if you will, in photography. Go and check the playlist that I put up on screen right now. That will give you an insight into a wide range of photographers who I'm sure that you will find inspiring and great. Thanks for staying with me today. I really appreciate you being here and I'll see you again soon.